The Cold War is largely synonymous with military confrontation, with grand politics, and the fate of the world. On this channel, we've talked about the movements of troops, the suppression and repression of dissenting voices, and the jockeying for influence that was so prevalent through the conflict. We've also hinted and alluded to the Cold War extending its influence into all facets of life, not just political and military. Well, today we're going to look at one of those facets, sports. Specifically, we're going to talk about the impact that the Cold War had on one sport in one country. I'm your host David, and today we're going to talk about Hungarian football, and how the Cold War ended the dreams of glory for one of the best teams to ever play the beautiful game. This is the Cold War. Football is undoubtedly the most popular sport in the world. A game that started formally in England in the 19th century, by the 1930s its reach was not only global, but ever expanding. International tournaments were being created, including the World Cup, first played in Uruguay in 1930. The home team won, by the way. Nations like France, Brazil, Italy, and Germany fielded strong teams that were routinely expected to win, much like the football landscape today. But, as you might expect, there were other national teams that were well regarded and highly successful. This included a pre Zlatan Swedish team, Czechoslovakia, and in the post war era, even Yugoslavia. But the teams that Hungary was able to put out in the late 1930s to the late 50s were truly exceptional. The current Hungarian national team is a shadow of its former self, but in the late 30s was a powerhouse of the game. The team, featuring players like Sarosi Gyurgy and Deak Ferenc, even reached the finals of the 1938 World Cup in France, losing out to the defending champions, Italy, by a score of 4-2. It was expected that Hungary would be favourites in the 1942 and possibly even 1946 World Cups, except for those tournaments being cancelled on account of a global war or something. Now, by the late 1940s, Hungary had gone through a process of Sovietization, which naturally extended itself into all aspects of life in Hungary, including sports. In line with many other countries behind the so-called Iron Curtain, Hungary declined to participate in the 1950 World Cup. Interestingly, the only Eastern European nation to participate in that World Cup was Yugoslavia, itself free from influence from Moscow after the Tito-Stalin split. But back to Hungarian football, although the opportunity at lifting the Jules Rimet Cup in 1950 was missed, that year saw the start of a true golden age for Hungarian football. Under the coaching supervision of Sheves Gustav, legendary players of the game like Puskas Ferenc, Göcsi Sándor, and Hidekuti Nándor took to the pitch. Sheves himself had not only been a world-class football player, having been a member of the 1938 World Cup squad, but importantly in Sovietized Hungary, was considered politically reliable due to his background as a trade union organizer in the 1920s during time spent playing football in both France and Budapest. Shebesh also happened to be the deputy minister of sports, so all this to say, he was trusted by the Hungarian government, eager to use the success of Hungarian football as a propaganda weapon. So how did Shebesh set out to do this? Well, he borrowed from the successful ideas he had witnessed as a player in the 1930s, especially from the Italian national team and Austria's Wunder team. Why reinvent the wheel when the plan is there to be emulated, after all? The idea was that the core of players selected for the national squad would all be from one or two club teams. The idea being that since they were already familiar with playing together, that it would make for a stronger, more united team. For those of you who play FIFA Ultimate Team, think of the chemistry formulas that get used to indicate in-game success. How this got implemented in Hungary was that a few select clubs were picked to receive increased government support, allowing them to gather the best players in the country into those clubs. Those clubs were Sebesh's original Hungarian club team, MTK Hungaria, and Kispest. As part of this government support, the management of the clubs was taken over by different government agencies. In the case of MTK, a historically Jewish club, it was taken over by the AVH, the secret police force, and went through several name changes, including Textiles SE, then Bastia SE, and then Vorosh Lobogo SE, and then finally back to MTK. 
players on the squad included Palotas Peter, Hidekuti Nandor, Lantos Pihali, and Zakarayas Yosef. But the core of Sebesh's national team was at Kishpest, taken over by the armed forces and renamed Kishpest Honved, most often referred to as simply Honved. As part of the armed forces, it was able to draft players from other clubs without any repercussions. It was for the army, after all. Honved already had both Pushka Schwerens and Bosig Yosef, but now added Kirchic Shandor, Chibor Zoltan, Budai Laszlo, Lorat Jula, and Grosic Jula to the squad. Interestingly, players like Kirchic, Chibor, and Budai all came from a third club, Ferenc Varoshi, which was deliberately overlooked by the government as it had a history and reputation as a club representing right-wing nationalism. So the table was set for success. But as anybody who follows the game knows, simply because you have great players does not guarantee wins. Tactical and strategic thinking is necessary to give great teams that edge to allow them ultimate victory. Fortunately for Hungary, Shevish was a man who had those gifts. Adapting ideas from other teams, including the 442 formation played at MTK, Shevish is considered one of the forefathers of total football, which would come into its own in the 1970s epitomized by Ajax and the Netherlands with the late great Johan Cruyff. The concept Shevesh promoted was that instead of players remaining in their assigned positions, they would all attack and defend together, replacing empty tactical positions if a player moved to another area of the pitch. Now, having skipped the 1950 World Cup, the first major opportunity Hungary had to show itself off on the world stage was at the 1952 Helsinki Olympics. The mighty Magyars dominated the tournament, comfortably winning the gold medal. Over the five games they played, they scored a total of 20 goals while only conceding twice. The impressive results were enough that the governing body of English football, the Football Association, invited the team to play a set of matches against England in 1953. The Golden team tore them apart at Wembley, the home of football, 3-6, only the second time in history that England had lost a match at home. The second leg, played at the Nebstadion in Budapest, saw the English team routed with a final score of 7-1, proving to the world that the first match was no isolated event and that the Hungarians were the real deal. The next major tournament was the 1954 World Cup, held in Switzerland. During the group stage, the mighty Magyars were ascendant, crushing South Korea 9-0 and West Germany, a tournament favourite by the way, 8-3. Moving into the knockout rounds, the Hungarians knocked out Brazil and then Uruguay by a score of 4-2 in both matches. Reaching the final of a World Cup for the second time in their history, they faced their opponent from the group stage, West Germany. Heavy favourites to win, Shebish's team took a commanding two-goal lead. In a huge upset, however, the final score of the game was 3-2 in favour of the West Germans. Some controversy surrounded the match, including some questionable refereeing and even unsubstantiated claims that the West German team was doping. Nevertheless, the opportunity for the Hungarians to lift the cup was lost. As a result of politics and global affairs, the opportunity would not present itself again, making the Hungarian team of the 1950s one of the strongest teams to never win a World Cup, on par with the Dutch team in the 1970s and the Brazilian side in the 1980s. So what happened? As we covered in a previous episode or two, October of 1956 saw the Hungarian people rise against the socialist regime and their Soviet handlers. Despite early successes, the uprising was violently crushed by both the Soviet army as well as the Hungarian secret police. And what did all of this mean for Hungarian football? Well, the 1956-57 football season saw Honved representing Hungary in the European Champions Cup as they had won the domestic league the previous year. They were drawn against Athletic Bilbao with the first leg to be played in Bilbao on November 22nd. This was literally only weeks after the brutal suppression of the uprising. The match was played with Athletic Bilbao winning 3-2. Now, as a result of the turmoil at home, the Honved players refused to return home despite many of them having wives and kids waiting for them. UEFA, trying to accommodate the players and keep the tournament moving, 
arranged to have the second leg played in Brussels in December. Although it had been arranged to have the players' families reunited with the team, it's highly likely that the ongoing upheavals were enough to disrupt the players, and the 3-3 draw was enough for Atletico Bilbao to eliminate Honved from the tournament. It also didn't help that Honved's keeper was injured during the match, and in the days before player substitutions, an already injured Chibor had to cover the net. Despite their early exit from the tournament, the players still refused to return to Hungary. Over the objections of both FIFA and the Hungarian government, Honved arranged for a European tour in order to raise money and provide some financial security for the players and their families. Now, Honved was already a popular team on the international stage, as is any team with a long list of top players. Think of Barcelona in 2014-15. No, seriously, go look at that squad. It's incredible. Honved's popularity was such that, finding itself homeless, they even received an offer of political asylum from Mexico, which included them re-establishing the club there to play in the Mexican League. While this offer was declined, the team did accept an offer to play a series of matches in Brazil against clubs like Flamengo and Botafogo. With the conclusion of that tour, however, Honved and its players found themselves in a more difficult position. FIFA by this time had ruled that the team as it was could no longer use the Honved name. This ruling was made under pressure from the Hungarian Football Federation, no doubt backed by the Soviet Union. At this point, many of the players made the decision to return to Hungary. But this didn't include all the players. Some of the most iconic players refused to go back and instead sought new clubs to play for. Men like Cibor and Kocic joined Barcelona, while Puskas, after a brief period in Austria, signed on at Real Madrid. Puskas went so far as to take Spanish citizenship in 1961 and played several games for Spain, including at the 1962 World Cup in Chile. For some of the players, the opportunity to get paid as a professional footballer in the West was a huge draw and something that wasn't possible back home in socialist Hungary. So what did all this mean for the mighty Magyars and the state of Hungarian football? Well, to put simply, it shook it to the core and weakened it fundamentally. Honved, who had a good chance of winning the European Cup, missed its chance. The 1958 World Cup saw Hungary qualify, but as a spent force, with only three players, Grosic, Bozic, and Hideguti returning from the 1954 World Cup squad. They failed to advance out of the group stage. While Hungarian football continued to meet some Olympic success over the coming years, as well as qualifying for several World Cups, notching their last win at a World Cup in a 2-0 win against Canada in 1986, the golden generation was gone. Now, football can be a funny old game, and there's never a guaranteed win, regardless of who may be playing. But the mighty Mudgers of the 1950s should have won national glory, and it was the intersection of world politics and the Cold War that prevented that chance from coming to fruition. The Golden Team is still celebrated in Hungary and is recognized around the world, even though many people may not quite realize it. One of the greatest players to play the game has a FIFA award named for him, the Puskas Award, established in 2009, celebrates the player who has scored the best goal of the year. And having just watched footage of Puskas and the Mighty Magyars playing the beautiful game, the award is well named. For anybody interested in further reading on the Mighty Magyars and their impact on the game, I can recommend Inverting the Pyramid, a History of Soccer Tactics, and The Names Heard Long Ago, How the Golden Age of Hungarian Soccer Shaped the Modern Game, both by Jonathan Wilson and available through local booksellers everywhere. And Amazon if you have to. We hope you've enjoyed today's topic, and to make sure you don't miss future episodes, please make sure you subscribe to our channel and have sent the bell button for review so that we can all clearly see it's onside, but no, the VAR refs have decided the edge of the bell was offside despite not being involved at all in the play. We can also be reached via email at thecoldwarchannel at gmail.com, and we're active on Facebook and Instagram at The Cold War TV. If you enjoy our work, please consider supporting us via www.patreon.com slash The Cold War or through YouTube membership. This is The Cold War Channel, and don't forget, the trouble with The Cold War is that it doesn't take too long before it becomes heated. <laughs>